Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Manager here at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And today, we are talking about sex, love, and marriage. And we're joined by Sean McDowell, Dr. Sean McDowell at Talbot School of Theology, uh, teaches apologetics there um, in the apologetics program, my alma mater on both counts, undergrad and MA Apologetics. Um, Sean and I go way back to our undergrad days. If you've seen the show before, we've talked about that. Um, Sean, so good to have you. Mikhail, thanks for having me back, buddy. Yeah, it's really, really good to see you again. Um, now, I want to get started by thinking about this this whole idea of sexuality in regards to a defense of the faith. You're well known as someone who helps people uh, think through how to explain and give good reasons for what we believe. How do you see the relationship between apologetics and this whole area of sexuality? I actually think some of the biggest apologetic challenges to this generation are not that Christianity's false, but that Christianity's bad that it's not good, that many are feeling shamed into their beliefs and either reject those beliefs or just kind of live them out with a little bit of defeatism because they don't understand why those beliefs are good and true and beautiful. So a part of our task in helping kids make wise decisions about sexuality is a worldview and apologetic component but it's not just that the Bible is true and the biblical sexuality is true. It's actually that it's good. It's that it's beautiful and that ultimately God is a God worth trusting in his character and his commands. Mm -hmm. Now, you wrote a book on this whole topic called Chasing Love, and I have it right here. It's a really good read, Chasing Love, Sex, Love, and Relationships in a Confused Culture is the subtitle. And as I was reading it, I was pretty happy. Actually, I didn't know when I first got it that it was written for Gen Z. And oh, good. I actually gave it to my son, um, just, just kind of left it there in his in his room, like, hey, if you want to check this out, my friend Sean wrote this, and uh, in one sitting he got to chapter six, so I'm going, wow. bring, I'm going to bring the book back after our podcast and just, just leave it there and, and see if he picks up the rest. Um, so, But Sean, in your book, I know there are a lot of parents who struggle with a lot of the questions that you've written about in your book, and this is kind of a really broad question, but I put it out there to a, n a number of parents on social, what do you struggle with? in terms of this whole area with your kids. And a lot of them were saying how and when to talk about these difficult conversations in terms of sexuality and gender identity and things like that. It's a really broad question, but how would you answer a parent who asked you that question? Let's start with when. And the answer to when is as soon as a kid is out of the womb. Hmm. I think, wait a minute, a two-week-old, <laughs> two-year-old, like how does that happen? Well. By the way we talk with a child, by the way we relate to a child, by the way we appropriately touch a child, we are beginning a kind of sex education, you could say, so to speak. So one simple way is when we're younger, rather than saying to a kid, that's your ding dong or your wee wee, just say that's your penis, that's your vagina and show comfort with the body that God has given us and that shows a comfort between the parent and the child to talk about these kinds of issues. My son is eight years old and the topic of abortion came up. I have three older kids in our home and it came up in the car. He goes, dad, what's abortion? I'm thinking, okay, he's eight. How do I have this conversation? This is an opportunity, but tailor in a way that makes sense to an eight year old that I don't give more than he's asking and less. And I don't pretend to always get that right, but that's the goal. So I think we should look for opportunities from the earliest stages possible just to affirm your being what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a girl, God's design for sex in age appropriate ways. Now, there may be a time where you sit down and have the talk in more depth, but I think the best education about sex is just ongoing conversations that begin really as soon as we are relating to and talking with our kids. Now, how we do this, that is a huge question. Um, so I, I guess I kind of answered 
both, but I would say as, as it relates to this book, may, let me focus there because how you do it with an eight-year-old is different than a 12-year-old versus a 16-year-old. Mm-hmm. But one thing I did with this book is I'm just trying to come up with any ways possible to talk with my kids and engage them on issues of sexuality. So two examples. One, my daughter was 12. Now she's 13. When I was finishing up the book, I said, hey, if you'd be willing to just read this whole thing. And then we go to coffee and you just tell me what we think, what you agree with, what was interesting to you. I'm not going to lecture her, but we talk about this. I'll buy you a pair of shoes. And she goes, dad, there's an outlet. I can get two pair for one. Will that work? I was like, fine so <laughs> she read it and then we sat down for probably somewhere to an hour hour and a half at the local coffee shop and my 12 year old daughter and i just talked about all the issues related to sexuality hmm. on a separate how my son who was 14 now he's 16 he wanted to see this movie uh bohemian rhapsody with queen a couple years ago it's pg-13 so it had a little bit of suspect content in it but i read it. i'm like it's not too bad he's 14 he asked me if he could go to it i said sure and you can bring a friend and i'll pay for you i'll buy you popcorn but one deal when we're done i just want to come back we're gonna sit down and talk about it i want to know what you think hmm. so i brought him brought a friend we came back he let it sit down he goes all right dad let's talk i was like okay so probably 25 30 minutes i was like hey what'd you think about the movie what did you enjoy what was your favorite scene I said, what do you think the message of the movie was? How do you think the message of this movie matched up with the biblical view? Did you ever feel the movie was preaching at you? And we just talked about the message in relationships. Mm -hmm. So again, when, as soon as possible, how in conversations regularly and consistently in relationship with our kids. Hmm. And that goes back to another conversation you and I had about the importance of relationships and the importance of parents in the lives of, of children speaking into this area. Uh, rather than thinking about just having the talk or just these punctuated, here we're gonna sit down and have these, these talks, um, setting a framework, really a biblical framework for God's design and, and the beauty of God's design. Well, for a Gen Z student who's thinking about this issue of sex before marriage how would you answer the question why they why should somebody consider waiting to have sex before marriage well what i don't want to do is couch that question just in terms of the benefits the person gets because this is one of the mistakes i think we've made in the past Mm. what's called purity culture is wait to have sex because in marriage you'll have the best sex Mm -hmm. that is basically saying follow god's plan because it benefits you now Mm. with that said i do it is interesting that religious men and women primarily christians report higher levels of satisfaction in their sex lives And that makes sense because if God is the designer of sex and we live and experience it the way he wants us to, there's a flourishing that I think is going to naturally come from this. But that's very different than saying to a young person, hey, don't have sex now. So when you get married someday, you're going to have awesome marital sex. That's like being obedient to God because of what you get out of it. And that's not what the scripture says because it just doesn't always work out that way. Mm -hmm. What I would say is I would take a step back and I'd say, okay, what you do with your sex life is a reflection of what you do with your life as a whole. Mm -hmm. Do you want to become the kind of person that loves other people and treats them the way they ought to be treated? Do you want to be a good person that really loves people? Or do you want to be the kind of person that uses people? Because if you just want to be the kind of person that uses people, there's probably nothing I could say Mm -hmm. that could motivate you to think about what Jesus taught. But if you actually want to love people, and I think in your heart you do, then let's take a look at the life of the person who arguably lived the greatest life of sacrifice and love and see what his sexual ethic is and why. And I think what you'll discover is that Jesus can be trusted, that his teachings 2,000 years ago make just as much sense today as when he taught them. 
Mm-hmm. I think, I, so the bottom line answer your question is I would try to invite this younger person into something bigger and frame their sexuality in terms of what kind of person are you becoming? What kind of life do you want to live? And then when we see it that way, I think it changes how we approach questions of home, of, of sexuality, how we use our bodies. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, the biggest motivation, Scripture says, be holy because I am holy. Trust God because he's trustworthy. Be holy because God is holy. That's the ultimate motivation, whether it benefits us in life or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the book, you talk about Jesus' sexual ethic actually bringing us real freedom. And you give a great example about uh, uh, driving your car. I've seen you do this, this illustration. Why don't you share that with us? So l- let me take a step back and frame what I mean by 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 freedom here, because this is really important. I'm glad you asked this. In the first third of the book, I'm trying to strip away these secular ideas that even kids in our best Christian homes have adopted in many ways wholesale. And one is a faulty view of freedom. So I recently went to this group of Christian students at a Christian school. There's maybe a dozen of them, 17, 18 years old. And I asked him to give me a definition of freedom. In fact, the way I worded it is I said, who is truly free? And they talked amongst themselves. They came back. They said, freedom is doing whatever you want without restraint. I said, okay, explain to me what the truly free person looks like. Paint a picture of that. And they said, a person alone on an island where nobody is restrained them and they do whatever they want. Hmm. I said, well, if God exists, does this change the definition of freedom at all? They said, well, if God exists... Freedoms do whatever you want without restraint, but now there's consequences. So these kids in a great Christian home, all God adds to the question of freedom is consequences in their mind. Hmm. Well, I point out to these students that they they only understand half of freedom. There's freedom from, which is lacking restraint, but there's also freedom for. We only know how we should live and what choices we make when we first know our design. So take a smartphone. When we know what the phone is for, then we know how we should use it. What's interesting is in the scripture starts by saying, in the beginning, God created. We're told that God is a purposeful creator. Well, what are we made for? To be in relationship with God and relationship with other people. That's what we're for. So a phone is for texting and emailing and calling. We are for relationships with God and other people. I said to the students, I said, that means ironically, the least free person is someone alone on an island Hmm. because they're not able to live what they're made for. Now, think about it this way. Let me use, uh, I use the car example in the book, but I use another example. Let me pull out of a piano. Okay, take a piano. It's a free person, someone who sits down at a piano and says, I can just bang this however I want to. Mm -hmm. Is that person free? Or is the person who understands the truth of the piano, the design of the piano, the purpose of the piano, and cultivates the discipline to use it according to its design and thus produces beautiful music? Which person is more free? Mm -hmm. And I think we realize that freedom is not living without restraint. It's actually embracing the right restraint, which means living according to God's design. If we don't reorient in the lives of our young people what freedom is, then we give them a biblical sexual ethic. They're going to filter it through the secular idea of freedom without even realizing it. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, you answer the in, in the book. There's a question about about hookups and what's what's so bad about a hookup, and you actually bring it back to what is sex even for? Um, tell, talk to us a little bit about the positive side of, of of the beauty of sex and what that is for, and, and how that helps inform um, the biblical view of of the hookup culture. So let me connect some dots just for our listeners the way we do with our students. At the beginning of the book, the way you asked, freedom is aligning our lives with truth. So then what's freedom in our relationships and freedom in sex? Well, that depends upon understanding the purpose of sex and Mm -hmm. its design and living out God's design. Well, I think scripture teaches three things. Number one, in Genesis 1, 27, 28, um, God makes a male and female, so it's populate and fill the earth. So one is procreation to make babies. Second, we're now in Genesis 2, 24. Man leaves his father and mother, clings or bonds with his wife and the two shall become one 
the second purpose of sex is a unique unity between a husband and wife, man and woman. The third purpose of sex that I believe is that it is a foretaste of heaven. I mean, it foreshadows what heaven will be like. Now, I don't mean in the way many uh, Muslims will say, if you die in a jihad, you get 77 virgins in heaven. That is not my point. What I find interesting is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word yada, which is often translated, means sexual relations. Adam knew his wife Eve. Abraham knew his wife Sarah. The word yada in Hebrew is a kind of knowing with somebody. You see, in our culture, we think sex is just a physical act, but it's actually a one flesh experience of the mind and the emotions and the relationship. It's a holistic kind of experience where you're intimately knowing somebody. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no marriage and sex in heaven, but the kind of unity and bonding and relationally knowing of somebody in sex, at least the way it's meant to be, is a foretaste for the kind of way we will know God and know other people. So I don't mean heaven is in the sexual sense. I mean sex here on earth has a deeper knowing sense, where in a sense there's no barrier between you and somebody else. People are meant to be naked and not ashamed in the sense that we don't wear a mask and we can love and be loved for who we are. That's how God designed sex to be. And that is a signpost, a foretaste, so to speak of the kind of knowing we will have of God and other people in heaven. I mm-hmm. think those are the three purposes of sex, scripturally mm-hmm. speaking. So do you think then the hookup culture is actually related to, to kind of naturalistic view of the world? If, if human beings are, are just physical, um, are just, just physical and have, have no spiritual component, um, does that make that connection in your mind? I think that's exactly right. So scripture teaches that we are embodied souls. You see in Romans 12 and Romans 6, it says, love God with yourself, and it says, love God with your bodies. So there's a sense where we're called to love God and other people with our souls, with our thinkings, with our emotions, and also love them bodily. We are to love God and love other people as unified beings. What the hookup culture says is we can separate our body from our soul that you can just give somebody your body, so to speak, for sexual pleasure without commitment, without relationship, and then move on with your life. And that's a very naturalistic idea that in fact probably reduces the human being down just to a body. Mm -hmm. But the problem is oftentimes when people will have sex without that commitment or relationship, there'll be an emptiness. There'll be a sense that I want more because sex is meant to be experienced in a loving relationship. And we cry out for unity and we cry out for bonding. So I I think you're on the right track with naturalism undergirding much of the hookup culture. Mm -hmm. And you're reminding me of another conversation we had in terms of showing people why God commands the things that he does for our flourishing, that we're, we don't just point people to the Bible and say it's true only because it's in the Bible, but rather it's in the Bible because it's actually true. And to show people not only um, what the Bible teaches, but why God has the best design for human flourishing. After all, he made us, he knows how we're designed and uh, how, how sex is best to be experienced um, in this world. We think about all the disorder and dysfunction in the world. Much of it is actually related to what the Bible calls sin. And in this area, um, the 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 whole porn uh, industry, the whole uh, area of pornography comes to mind. You've probably seen an article that I've seen called "Sex Before Kissing," where you have young kids, um, where you have fifteen-year-old girls, many of them who assume that boys are going to do. Uh, really evil things to them in in the sexual mm. act because of of how boys have been um, exposed to to porn and porn scenes. Um, how have I know you work with a lot of Gen Z students? How in your ministry have you seen pornography affecting uh, people in this way? Oh gosh, I I think pornography has changed everything literally everything. I'll give you a couple examples. Students are not first learning about sex from their parents. 
They're not learning about it from sex ed in school. They're learning about it from pornography, either through their friends or through seeing it. Pornography is the primary medium that is teaching this generation what to expect, how to treat people, and how to relate to people with their bodies. That's a staggering, devastating fact if we start to think through and apply that. The second thing is pornography has shifted these issues younger and younger and younger because of access that comes with uh, smartphones. And even if a kid doesn't have a smartphone, I've heard of babysitters, I've heard of friends at school, teammates, you name Mm -hmm. it. Kids are seeing this younger and younger and younger. The reality is we know from brain research, the younger that somebody sees these kinds of images, the greater imprint it has, so to speak, on their brain and affects them for the long run. I posted on a Instagram, it was this little post I called three myths of pornography and you click through one, two, three, and one was it doesn't affect me. And mm-hmm. This guy made a comment, it was heartbreaking. He said, thanks for doing this. Someone showed me pornography when I was five and it hmm. damaged me more than I can even explain. And this was an adult. Wow. So it's shaped the way they think about sex, the script of what young people expect, to be honest with you. Things like anal sex have increased in practice because people see it in pornography and assume that's what's pleasurable and that's how you treat people. Uh, Another thing, I mean, it's amazing. We have this Me Too movement Mm -hmm. of women crying out, don't abuse me sexually. And I support that premise, obviously, powerfully. Mm -hmm. But not a lot of people who've pushed the Me Too movement have asked the question, where do men get the idea that they can take advantage of women like this? And the elephant in the room is pornography. Pornography, so much of it has been documented to be violent and degrading, and the woman smiles and enjoys it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just every area affected relationships on this. And I think the vast majority of kids, even in Christian homes, are looking at it, at least to a degree, to be honest. You know, we had your dad on the show talking about this very issue, and he said something really powerful mm. that that I remember. He said that if he said, as an apologist, I felt like if I did not address pornography, that I'm not fulfilling God's calling on my life. It was wow. that powerful for him. He says one of wow. the biggest barriers for kids coming to Christ is pornography. And he told the story about a uh, crew did this survey at one of their events where 485 students were asked, what is the number one barrier to you becoming a serious disciple of Jesus? And he told us, you will never believe it. He was telling Daryl Bach this, all 485 students said pornography. Huh. Gosh, I haven't even heard that. And That's this is... Just- this is amazing. Um, it is an area that it's uncomfortable to talk about. It's an area that uh, it's uncomfortable for, for parents. It's uncomfortable for youth leaders and pastors. But how would you counsel people who are working with students, especially um, parents, teachers, pastors, to begin to speak into this area in a healthy way? Well, I, I would counsel a few things. Number one, we got to start young. I've mm-hmm. already had a conversation with my eight-year-old You know, define pornography as just inappropriate images that people put on phones and on the internet showing their bodies without clothes, something like that to my Mm eight-year-old. And we read a book about how when I just last week was like, a kid goes like this, what do you do? You look away. And I practiced it with my Mm. eight-year-old. Kid goes, well, come on, Shane, look at this. What are you, a sissy? I said, you respond back to me. I don't want to look at it. No, thanks. I actually walk that through with my son and have him practice those things. So we got to start young and we have to give our kids practical tools how to avoid some of the snares of pornography. The other thing is we have to talk about it and teach on it. I was doing a weekend event with my dad and it was an entire weekend, Friday and Saturday. We, if I remember, we had eight or 900 people and it was on sexuality as a whole. And this 12 year old came up with his mom, tw- maybe 12 or 13, he said, I want to thank you for talking about pornography, but not just saying it's bad, explaining why. Mm -hmm. Nobody had explained to me why pornography is bad. Well, that kid just moved from a rule, believing a rule, which could be legalism, 
sometimes to having a conviction that goes deeper in his life. So I not Mm -hmm. only taught against it, I taught here's what the Bible teaches and here's why God deems it wrong and gives us different directions for how we're supposed to behave. The other thing is when we talk about this, we have to just douse it, especially with Christian kids, God's grace and love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I had a girl email into my website, I don't know if I remember, maybe three years ago. And when I get emails, I never email back to a girl, but I tagged a lady. I said, hey, thanks for emailing. Here's a woman I trust. I want to connect you with her. She can help you out. So she was in the conversation chain. I said, but just one thing I want you to know, because this girl that emailed in said she's struggling with pornography so deeply she feels ashamed and can't quit i said i'm gonna hand you over to this friend of mine but i just want you to know that god loves you she emails me just a few weeks ago and said that wrecked me i didn't think because of what i was doing that god could love me and when i read that email i've not looked at it again hmm wow now not every kid who hears that message is going to respond the same way but we have to teach why We have to have good boundaries, build relationships with our kids, give them tools to say no, and just douse the entire thing with God's grace and love and acceptance. Oh, that's an amazing story. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember if I said your dad's actual name for our listeners. Uh, Sean's (laughs) dad is Josh McDowell. And uh, when I was growing up, I was in fifth grade. I read read the Why Wait thing, and uh, that was my first time hearing about Sean's dad, Josh McDowell. But if you go back in our archives, cool. we have a show called Freedom from Pornography, and that is the show that uh, Sean's dad, Josh McDowell, is on. There's also a woman named Joy Pedro on that show, who's a DTS grad, who works with women who are struggling with uh, pornography addiction as well. So it's another another thing that uh, is not talked about as much, is uh, not only focusing on how this affects men, but how this affects young women as well, and women of all ages, really. Um, there are some things in this in this book, Sean, that were not in the Why Wait series that your dad did in yeah. the early days, in my early days at least. And one of them is something that nobody thinks about. It sounds crazy when I'm about to say it, but is it okay to have sex with a robot? Now, this is a crazy <laughs> question for so many people because mind blown, is this even a thing? But apparently at the... Uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, there was a doctor who talked about this and the psychological ramifications, the moral issues. Um, How do we even begin to navigate a category that most pastors, most people in ministry do not even have um, as something they need to think about in their minds? In case people are still listening going, really, we are talking about sex with a robot. This is nuts. NPR is probably I don't know, five or six months ago, did an entire show on conventions and a movement of people that are having sex with robots. This is a growing phenomena that we have to weigh the Christian worldview into today. Now, one way is to talk about lust. Mm -hmm. This is the easy way out, right? If you're going to have sex with a robot, it's clearly going to involve a kind of lust. And Jesus rules this out in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. It's a heart issue of lusting. Now to say, well, it's just a robot, not a real person, but it's made to look like a person. It's made to feel like a person. In some cases, made to smell like a person. So the fact that it's a simulation doesn't take away from the lust that I think scripture would condemn. So that's the easy first point. But the other point is, and this has come up in some of the conversations, how does having sex with a robot shape our affections, shape our brains, and shape the way we treat people? That's a really interesting question. So if somebody is interacting and having sex with a robot, they are shaping their brains to respond sexually to a fabricated non-person rather than to a human being. And we don't think there's not going to be negative consequences in turn how we treat human beings. It is shaping our affections uh, in powerful ways. So that's another reason. I mean, people are even asking about, 
like those who say, well, it's just a robot. It's not real. What about robots that are shaped to look like kids? Mm -hmm. This is a genuine question. Mm -hmm. You don't, people would say, well, people who have these kinds of issues, this is a natural outlet for them. And I'm saying, no, I think this is stoking the fires and building habits that not only is the act itself wrong, but it's going to have worse consequences where people eventually are going to have to act this out. So I think for a number of reasons, we should have serious caution, but we also should just kind of be willing to talk about this because this is literally where part of the conversation in our culture has gone. Yeah, you know, technology is a great thing, and we, it allows us, you and me, to have this conversation right now. But so many things uh, that are, are being used in, in dysfunctional kinds of ways like this. Uh, the lady that I talked about, the doctor I, I mentioned, actually talked about uh, robots that were AI programmed to, to um, act out rape scenes with people. So ah. the, this the degradation and the uh, uh, mental issues, the psychological issues, so emotional issues, all this stuff, um, we are going to need to, as a church, step up into this brave new world of um, all, all these different issues. But I think in some way, the, the sex with the robot thing um, is related to VR, is related to just imagination in your mind. Um, you talked about how do you navigate the question about masturbation? And I think a lot of that comes into play as well with starting with, with a lust. Uh, how would you speak to that question? I know many Christians are um, in a variety of places on that. How do you counsel someone to think through that idea? Yeah, it actually surprised me when I read this, how much of difference and debate there is amongst not only Christians, but conservative Christians. Some saying it's always wrong, some saying it's fine as long as there's not lust. Here's where I kind of land on this. Again, same with sex with a robot idea, is that if there's lust involved in masturbation, it's necessarily wrong (laughs) because uh, Matthew 5, Jesus rules this out. So that's the easy one. But then I've had a response. People say, well, it's just a physical process and it feels good. And I'm able to masturbate without there being um, images of another person and lusting. That's where I say, okay, that seems to be a step in the right direction. But is there any reason that a Christian should have concern with this? And my concern is that, again, I think it's conditioning somebody in a sense to have sex with themselves, where sex is designed and sexual pleasure, according to scripture, to be experienced in the presence of another human being that you're committed to in marriage of the opposite sex. That's God's design for sex. So somebody who's experiencing masturbation is focusing on themselves and their individual pleasure, not using the sexual outlet to love another person. And I'm concerned how that starts to become habitual because it's focusing inward on the self pleasure. Now, somebody, I did a short YouTube video on this, like I think like a three to four minute response saying the same thing. And somebody said, well, what about food? We don't think food is wrong if it pleases the self. And I say, well, food is designed for an individual to enjoy. But is that the design for sex? I think sex is designed outward towards another. And there's a kind of pleasure that clearly comes with it. And that's part of the blessing from God. But it's meant to be experienced in relationship with another human being. So I don't want to be somebody who's just throwing shame on somebody, making somebody feel bad and be legalistic. That's the last thing I want. I want this filled with grace and love and understanding. But I think we have to help people think through these issues and say, what kind of person are we becoming? How is it forming our sexual desires and activities? And is it ultimately in line with who God wants us to be? And that's where I think it should at least give us some pause and reflection. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. God has designed sex to to have this bond between a man and a woman, and that bond is is not present in in these these things that we're discussing, and so certainly outside God's design. Now we've we've talked mostly about sex in this discussion, but the book is also about marriage and love. Uh, in discussing that, 
We also have to consider um, people who don't land there in marriage but remain single. Now, you talked a little bit about that in the book. How would you counsel uh, pastors who are talking about this with students to not make marriage seem like the end all of you know the telos and the goal of of this whole thing that um, love and relationships are are present in in the life of single people as well. How do we um, talk about what the Bible says in that regard? Well, who is arguably the most relationally fulfilled person who's ever lived? I think we're going to have to say Jesus, right? God mm-hmm. in human flesh never sinned. He wasn't married, and he didn't have sex. What does this tell us? That sex and marriage are not required to have a satisfying, fulfilling, God-honoring life. Now, somebody might say, well, that's easy for you to say. You've been married two decades. And I say, well, it's actually not easy for me to say that. My point is to point towards Scripture. Say, what does Jesus teach in Matthew 19? What does Paul teach in 1 Corinthians 7? And I think the scriptural message is, is that singleness and marriage are two equal, God-honoring ways of living our lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, hey, marriage is awesome, but he actually even says, I wish many of you, if not all of you, were like me. Not quite mm-hmm. the glowing endorsement of marriage that's often given from the conservative mm-hmm. religious right. He's like, actually, there's tough things about marriage, and there's benefits of singleness. My point is we need to bring back a balance and rather than saying or showing through our actions in the church that singleness is the B or C or D or F or Z prize, it is a gift to the church and marriage is a gift to the church. So I would start if a young person is asking questions about this to say, let's actually go to scripture and see how good and beautiful and wonderful singleness can be and marriage. I would start there. I had a lady who was single when I was printing out the chapter before I published the book. Hmm. She was in the room where I was printing and just saw it and read it. And she told my wife, she goes, look, I was in tears because I had never heard a theology of singleness Hmm. that talked about its goodness and its beauty. She's like, I've been in the church and I've never heard this. That's a tragedy. So, We've got to theologically correct that and do a better job. I mean, even Jesus, he redraws family lines. He goes, no, it's those who are obedient to my father vertically rather than my biological family. So marriage is important. I would never downplay that, but we need to raise up our emphasis (laughs) and our focus on singleness, especially because people are less likely to get married now, millennials and Gen Zers, and those who do get married later. Not only theologically, but practically, we got to do a better job of this in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning of your book, you talked about how um, one of the the greatest uh, questions that we get from this generation has to do with gender identity and uh, homosexuality. And I will tell you, when I was reading that, I was thinking, you know what? This is true that wherever I go to speak, even if I'm giving an argument for the existence of God or talking about the problem of evil, when Q&A comes, someone will say, um, how do I relate to my gay friends? Yep. So how can we help our, our Christian students, especially in church, um, begin to, to engage in a way that is, that is loving and understanding, but also um, is, is convicted and, and holds on to biblical convictions in this area? Not long ago, I was visiting a Christian school, and I do this role play thing. I'll be an atheist, I'll be a Muslim, I'll be pro choice. Well, I was role playing a pro same sex marriage position. And these are juniors, seniors in high school, Christian school. I start off by making an argument for same sex marriage. A girl raised her hand like three minutes into it. She goes, You know what? I want to uh, defend natural marriage. I don't even have a clue where to start. And all the students are like, You got us in three minutes. We don't even know. The first thing with our students is to start talking about what is marriage? What does scripture teach about marriage? How do you make a case for natural marriage without even relying upon the Bible? Like you said earlier, Mikkel, that what's biblical is true, what is true is biblical. Mm -hmm. So first thing is what gives us confidence to engage people with different worldviews. It's when we understand what we believe and why we believe it. 
The second thing is we got to give role models to young people. That's why in the chapter on homosexuality, I framed it within Chris, the story of Christopher Yuan, mm -hmm. a same-sex attracted single man, good friend of mine, who's living out the biblical ethic on sexuality as a single man in a fulfilling way. We need to give young people models and say, look, this story you're hearing from the culture, you're seeing on Netflix that seems to be ever-present. There are people resisting this notion and living out faithfully to what Jesus taught. And the third thing is just help them find the balance between truth and love. How do we build relationships with people? It's not us versus them. Let's step down from the culture wars. But how do we love people with a different worldview? And a good friend of mine told me about how his daughter in high school befriended a young, a young man who was gay. And they would study together. They'd talk. They just became friends. And when this young man was over at their house, he asked me, he goes, he goes, hey, young man, I understand you're not a Christian. Like, this is a guy who just calls him out. <laughs> he goes, would you ever think about following Jesus? And he goes, you know, I, I, I've thought about it. He goes, I'm not ready to right now. But if I did, it would be because of someone like your daughter. Hmm. I thought, wow, just loving people, caring for people, being the kind of friend with somebody that we would want them to be with us. That's what our young people need. So a biblical worldview models of people doing this and um, the ability to build relationships with people who see the world differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Sean, you you have given us so much in in this uh, this short time together. I really love the uh, illustration of role playing the phone thing with with your son. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to use that. That's really good. Do it. <laughs> if there's one takeaway that was for you that you would take away after completing this study, I know you've done other uh, other works on on marriage and sexuality, but at this point, what has been your major takeaway from from all your studies in this area? Oh my gosh, that is such a big question. I, you know, something, too, that you just pop, something that just popped to my mind is the chapter on cohabitation. Mm. I started researching a lot of that, and I had read a few studies before, but when I really delved in, the research I came across was really powerful that basically, if you want to put a potential future marriage in jeopardy, live with somebody before you're married. Mm. I knew that the biblical pattern would benefit people, and I'd heard some studies. But when I really drove into this and talked with Glenn Stanton from folks in the family, looked at data, I was like, wow, this is even more powerful than I had realized. So that gave me increased confidence to speak out on this issue and make sure young people know that living with someone puts them at a disadvantage. So here's how I put it, Mikhail. Think about this. There is nothing that a young person can find out by living with somebody else that they can't find out another way that has any relevance for a successful marriage. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And second, it'll put them at a disadvantage. That was one of the surprises in my research. I just didn't expect that strong going into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for joining us once again here on the table. Uh, I hope that you will uh, join us again some other time. I know that we, you and I will be in contact. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. You're a pro at this and a good friend. Thanks, Sean. And we thank you very much for watching and listening to The Table podcast as well. We hope that you will join us next time on The Table. And please do subscribe to the show uh, wherever you're consuming this content on iTunes or YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you next time. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Table podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.